Happy New Year, gang. Um, you know, look to the left and look to the right. Um, those seats represent, those empty seats represent people that enjoyed the New Year too much. And uh, we'll pray that they'll be back in church next week. And uh, no, but um, I'm glad you're here. Um, um, I'm really excited about this year. Um, I won't get into all the specifics. Maybe the Lord will lead me to tell you more. Uh, I've been, uh, I've committed a, a, a good deal of time the last three plus weeks with some people. And again, um, the time doesn't matter when we prayed. But um, I'm really humbled, and you don't even realize it. And I want to say, you're in a phenomenal church for this reason, as far as specifically. There have been people all over the world, uh, and it, it isn't a lot. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's ten. But certain times when we pray, generally it's at night, in Springfield, Swaziland, Australia, Washington. For the last three plus weeks, there have been people, we have been interceding and asking God to absolutely abundantly bless this church from the standpoint of revival, that God would begin to use City Center Church from a standpoint of revival like the world has never seen. And I want to encourage you to get your heart and your mind in line with that and ready for it because for God to do what he needs to do through this church, he's got to use you. That means he has to elevate your influence. He has to elevate your income. That means he has to elevate your um, your abilities and your talents. And so for God to get things into this church, he has to elevate things in your life. And so one of the greatest things that could ever happen would be for what's been going on in the last three plus weeks. And I just want to encourage you to continue to get ready to shift your faith and believe God for the unexpected. Believe God for the supernatural. Believe God for extraordinary things because I believe that the things that we have been um, believing for for years. And some of you that are new to, the, new to the church, you don't know everything that we have been believing for and everything that we have gone through, and that's okay. But I believe that this is the year that the, that the striving stops and the thriving begins. I believe that with all my heart prophetically for the house. And so uh, we've been in this series, uh, Just One Stone, for the last two months. I've used 1 Samuel 17, 40 a great deal as the main text. I'm actually going to preach out of that today. But for the last two months, we have done our best to encourage you and to build your faith. And because it's what the Lord told me back in September, he gave, the th- gave us the theme for this church for 23 is the year of slave giants. That's what we're believing God. Things that you have been believing God for, for your life. And for years you've been asking, for years you've been seeking, and I don't know why you have struggled. I don't know why I've struggled for things and with things for years. But this year, it stops in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So the year of slave giants. And so the last two months, we have been spending every single Sunday challenging you with faith messages and building up your faith. And I believe there was, there was a reason behind what God had us do for today's message in particular. Because... To go in to this year and to slay the giants that God is going to have you slay. You're going to have to have faith like never before because other people will tell you it's impossible. There's no way. You don't have the intelligence yet. You don't have the background. You don't have the, you don't have the acumen. You don't have the maturity. You don't have the knowledge. You don't have the right color. You don't have the right whatever. And this is the year, I tell you, it changes. But the faith is going to have to continue to grow and expand. And that's why prayer and fasting. I pray, listen, no pun, I pray you hear me on prayer and fasting. If you're new to prayer and fasting, please try. I don't know what it's going to be. And again, people get, the church gets so wrapped up in different things. It has to be this way. You know what? I'm just, and we're actually, this will be one of my points today, just follow Jesus. That's what, that's what we teach here. What is, no, no, it doesn't matter what I said. What does Holy Spirit say? I didn't design you, and Jack ain't going to die for you. I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I ain't give my time for you. I'm, but I love me and my family more than I love you. I, I, mean, I ain't Jesus. He left everything to give you everything. Come on. So for the next 21 days starting tomorrow, it, 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 you might be a Daniel fast. You might do a liquid fast. You might fast TV. You, mass, you might fa- fast Netflix. Or Prime. Or Peacock. And if anyone has access to Peacock, I'd love to have access before tomorrow because I'd like to see the new, I would love to see the new Ric Flair documentary. Anyway, um, 
sorry, I'm an 80, 80s guy from um, wrestling days. Whatever it looks like, fast something that is, okay, that is dear to you. Oh, sorry, okay. Fast something that is near to you so that you can get something that is dear from him. I'll say it that way. And just, and, and I'm, just I'm just telling you kind of what I'm even here. I hadn't, this is not my notes. If you've ever done studies and done intermittent fasting, they will tell you physiologically there are certain stubborn fat cells. I don't, I don't, this is really cool insight from Holy Spirit. There are, there are stubborn fat cells that no matter what you do, you won't lose unless you what? Fast. There, there are certain stored up pockets of fat in your body that you will not lose unless you fast. And there are certain stored up pockets of problems in some of your lives that have been in a continuous cycle. You don't know why you keep going back to it. You don't know why you keep getting bit by it. You don't know why you keep to struggle. And it, these things go out by prayer and you've read the Bible. Let's follow that. So I just want to encourage you, starting tomorrow. So you know how, you know how us, us Christians do, as evangelicals. The fast starts tomorrow. Well, I have to binge watch for 10 hours and eat every, every bite of apple pie and pecan pie. I'm going to, oh my gosh, are you serious? I can't have a crumble cookie before tomorrow. No, I guess not. I don't know what to tell you. You know, you know it's like we, we, we actually just gorge like we're on our deathbed. And, and, you want, and, and you are. You're dying to self. Yeah, so I just want to encourage you. Find something that is near to you to be able to get something that is dear from him. Amen? All right. Today I want to talk to you about five smooth stones. We've talked about the stone. We've talked about the faith, the aspect of what it's going to take to see giants fall in your life. Uh, I mean, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. In 1 Samuel 17, and we'll get there, David picked up, y'all, many of you know the story. If you're new to church, um, it's, a great, it's a great Bible, Bible read, great story. David picked up five smooth stones. One was for Goliath. And <clears throat> experts think that the other four were for his brothers. Now, we... we we, we, we actually do not know um, what the other four other descendants were, but we knew that they were giants. Some have said one, again, there was five smooth stones. One was for the, uh, Goliath and four were for his brothers. Uh, most theologians believe that there were four brothers of Goliath, but really the Bible's not very clear. It may have been um, for um, uh, maybe uh, Goliath's sons. We don't know. But we do know that there were four other giants scripturally. And David's men killed them because the Bible was clear, and we'll get into this passage. It said he was weak and exhausted. But I'm wondering real quick, and if you just, just um, indulge me if you don't mind. If those four, let's just say brothers, came to take the body of their brother away, and they saw, you know, and they saw the stone and maybe embedded in the school, even though the head was chopped off, and I, I wouldn't even, the, con, listen, the context of what, I don't know if you've ever, because everyone just preaches on Goliath, head chopped, amazing. If you knew what the word Goliath in Hebrew meant, and if you put them together, it's Golgoth, and that the head was taken to Jerusalem, and it couldn't be taken in the city because you couldn't take, uh, you know, a non-Jew into the city because a Gentile was considered, you know, yeah, unclean. So the head of Goliath, and if you get, if you get to take the word, the compound word of Goliath in Hebrew, Golgoth, it went to Golgoth, which is where Christ was buried and where he died. Anyway, the, the Bible is so amazing when you have the actual right books to make it come to life. It's greater than any Netflix. I'm just telling you, it's fun, especially with some cookies after 21 days. Anyway, I just want to throw that in there. But, you know, but again, what, what about if someone came up to these, these brothers or these sons, and said, hey, uh, uh, we saw him pick up five smooth stones. <laughs> uh, one went into your brother, one went into your son, and we've heard, we've heard that he's been going around, the rumor going around is the other four for you all. And I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering maybe for a second, think about maybe the natural vengeance that you might feel as a brother, or maybe a son of Goliath. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about five smooth stones that I think um, some Goliaths are coming after you uh, with. So I'm kind of using this as an analogy. There are, I believe that there are five key areas. There's others, but I believe that there are five key areas that the enemy is coming after you with. And the reason I, I believe this with all my heart is because I am seeing people that I've looked up to. I'm seeing um, people that I've, 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 I've been connected with throughout the course of my 46 years, 25 full-time years of ministry. 
and just life in general. I'm seeing people young and old being taken out left and right by these five things, especially in the last two years. And these are the areas that Satan is using to take out men and women. He's using it to take men and women out of ministry, out of their calling, out of their marriage, and out of their destiny. So 1 Samuel 17, verse 40 says, uh, uh, Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a, and, and a pouch, which he had. And a sling was in his hand, and he journeyed to the Philistines. Now we're going to jump over. Don't paper cut yourself. 2 Samuel 21. I'll read it. We got, the, we got it on the screen, I believe. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishbi Binob, sounds like a Star Wars character, to be honest with you, um, who was one of the sons of the giant, um, the weight of um, whose bronze spirit was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, because the enemy will always try to come out you with new ideas. When the last ones don't work. That's why you just keep using the same thing Jesus always used, which is the word, to come against the new ideas of the enemy, and they won't work like the last ones didn't work, and you just keep forging ahead. Anyway, because they thought they could kill David. Again, what we believe is that there was a giant and maybe had five sons and Goliath was one, but this giant could be referring to Goliath, and this could be one of his sons. Again, the Bible is not very, very clear on this, but the point is there was a giant. I want you to hear me, and again, I don't do doom and gloom. I am not that type of a preacher. I don't even know how you can be a doom and gloom preacher and, 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 and preach the gospel, which means good news. Nowhere in, the, nowhere in the Bible are we encouraged and commanded to preach bad news. Now, there will be warnings, but you know what? The warnings, when done in grace, are actually good news. Amen. You're not afraid of things that he's called to protect you from, and he does protect you from. Amen. So, but I want you to hear me. You're watching online. Please hear me. All the kids, please hear me. In fact, this will be a good little time to put a little disclaimer. Um, there will be a part of the message. I am going to go a little bit of in-depth from a maturity standpoint with some of my references. It's a great time to reference. We have a phenomenal City Kids uh, ministry. We have, a, In fact, starting today, we have a, a phenomenal new uh, City Kids pastor. I'd love for you to meet her and her family. They're incredible. They're phenomenal. But uh, if, you, if you don't like your kids to hear mature things, and it's not like I'm going to go overly in-depth, but there might be a word that I use that I'm not going to apologize for, a reference that I'm not going to apologize for, because we are adults in here. Amen. So, just want to put that out there. But I want to promise you, promise you, that there is a demonic spirit who has been assigned to kill you. The enemy has us wandering the streets, staying awake at night, all upset making our fellow men to be the bad person, people in authority to be the bad person. And there are, yes, bad people in the world. But there's a demon and a devil that's using people, and we make people the bad people instead of, and so we get mad at people online instead of rebuking the devil on our knees. Your spouse ain't the problem. The devil's the problem. Your boss ain't the problem. The devil's the problem. Well, well if someone should rebuke the devil, why don't you try that? You ain't got to email it. You ain't got to send an offering in for it. You just have to command it. And see, until the church understands the authority they have in Christ, they will continue to live as beggars, and they will live in an impoverished spiritual state. You are called to speak, declare, mountains go, demons flee, sickness out, unity come in Jesus' name. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to still kill and destroy. Now, the wording here in the Greek is not worded like a normal Greek sentence would be worded. I want you to think about this. You would normally say something like this. The thief comes only to still kill and destroy. And some versions even say that. But they are dynamic translations, not exact equivalency translations. They're, they're, they're not a word for word. They're a thought for thought. So Jesus said, the thief does not come. In other words, he stays home unless he comes to still kill and destroy. He's not coming to have dialogue with you. It amazes me when people and preachers, and thank God for the deliverance ministers and ministry that is out there, they will sit there and they'll have a dialogue with the devil. Trying to show off, and in the form of using the power God gave them, they're operating in pride. That's scary to me. 
The devil doesn't, listen, you don't sit there and have dialogue with the devil. You come in and out of the individual that maybe that spirit is consuming, not maybe, but you definitely come in and out. And then Jesus, come, fill, do what you can. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to talk to the devil. He's got nothing good to say. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Every time the lips of the devil is, are moving, he's lying. And every time the lips of, of, of God are moving, he's loving. But there are demonic spirits that are upset. I want you to hear me. And those that will come in next week, hear me. And you need to tell someone this week, you, you, hey, hey, you, need, you need to hear me. There are demonic spirits that are upset that you have come in and started changing the atmosphere of your home and the business you started or the business you work in or the marriage you're at or the new marriage you're in or whatever. There are demonic spirits that are P-O'd, K-O'd, and T-O'd and every other O'd. And I want you to know they are coming after you and they desire to kill you. They're not going to sit down and butter your bread and try to help you with keto and figure out an assignment for your, for your job to get you promotion. They want to kill your marriage. They want to destroy your destiny. They want your children going to hell. They want everything about you dead. And we sit here and we placate and we, we, and, and we have fun with things that are a serious matter. And I've said it before. It's amazing to me that Hollywood believes more in the supernatural than the church. And the reason that is is because the church is comfortable with demons sitting in most pews. So I'm going to just give you five smooth stones I believe that they're using and that they're coming in. And number one, the big one is money. You're like, well, I, 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 I ain't got a whole lot. Let me, I just want to talk to you for a little bit. I just, just want to follow the edge. I just want to pass you just for, for a few moments. I'm watching more people and leaders, especially young people and young leaders, being taken out by money today than ever before, especially in ministry. And I'm just going to talk from my perspective for a bit. When I was growing up, preachers didn't have money because the church did a good job of keeping them poor and godly. Thank you, th- thank you for that, by the way. I, mean, I, mean, I remember those days growing up, and, growing up like that. I mean, and I will just tell you, and let me just put this out there. Preachers do need to be careful. I, I, I am all for preachers having an abundance. <laughs> Listen. If you knew what preachers went through on the average, that's why 40% of pastors have resigned in the last two years and more are, 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 are coming to exit because of the requirements. The, I mean, the expectation that you have to do and have to be, it's exhausting. But you didn't call me to it. Jesus did. And I tell these young people, they're like, well, look at so-and-so. And, listen, and there are preachers, and it's amazing. People get so upset. I mean, you know, the world can write a book about nothing and get everything. And all of a sudden, somebody writes a book about the Bible and makes a little bit of money. <gasps> are you giving all that away? You, you ain't my God. You ain't my sheriff or my police. You're supposed to be my brother and sister. And you ain't acting like any of them. You know, so, you know, so I mean, there, there, there's preachers that have gotten a $13 million signing bonus on a book. Thank God. But I will tell you, in ministry, there are just also just certain things you can't do. There are just certain things you can't drive. There are just certain things you can't own. And if people don't like it, I say, then get out of ministry. Not that you shouldn't have it, but it's causing somebody else to stumble. And this goes back to the Pauline epistles and the whole idea of the gospel. If what I've got in my life is causing somebody to stumble, I'm not going to have it. I'm, I'm not against nice things. But... Again, preachers need to have a little bit more wisdom sometimes with what they flaunt. And sometimes you know exactly who I'm talking about. And I'm actually not talking about anybody, but I've seen that some of them are my friends online. I'm like, I wouldn't have said that. I, I, I probably wouldn't be doing that video with my shirt off. I probably wouldn't be calling my wife that. Be an example. I ain't coming down on nobody. I don't have nobody in my head. The Lord knows, the Lord knows my heart. But ministers have to be careful. And preachers have given their life to serve people, and at the end of their life, they didn't have much to show for it. And finally, thank goodness, some great people figured it out over the course of the last 30 years, and, 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 and they knew that, men, this, this pastor needs a tough job, and they helped preachers a little bit. And preachers actually begin to actually own their home and, you know, instead, of, instead of living in a borrowed residence. So my ultimate desire, I can tell you this, if, if, if we haven't talked a great deal or sat down and maybe I haven't shared this in a while, I'm, I do my best to be pretty transparent my ultimate desire is to steward well my soul family in this church. Amen. And I have learned, especially in the last two years. I'm a little late to the game. That's okay. Um, I just have to get over a few things in my head and my heart because at 46, and I'll just be honest with you, 
you know, 46, some people in the world are starting to retire. And so at 46, preachers are thinking, oh, my, my, best, my, my best days are behind me. It's amazing that when culture is just starting to retire, that's when the kingdom is just starting to amp up because statistics say that the most influential years of a preacher are between 52 and 72. So you've spent the last 30 years going through crud and junk to now have some influence because he ain't just going to give you everything. You have to steward it well. And I've learned in the last two years that the greatest thing that I can give my family in this church is a healthy me. And I have worked hard. I have worked extremely hard on the health of my soul and the health of my emotions with things that I've just barely shared that I would never go even in, even in depth, don't need even, even, even need to. And I thank God by his grace, I'm still in the game. And that's all I'll tell you. And so I, I'm working very hard. I, I've got a ways to go. But I can tell you, like I've said before, I haven't arrived, but I've left. And I'm working very hard on the health of my heart, my home. I'm reading books like never before. I'm doing workbooks like never before because I, I refuse to go back to a place of bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness or constantly reciting my hurt. And I'm, I will encourage you to do the same, but I want you to know that I'm on the same journey of health as you are. And I realize that, again, I've got to have health in every aspect of my life, and that includes the church. So we are working toward a healthier savings account in our church. I think we currently have um, maybe a little over four months of savings in the bank. That's not bad. Most churches don't have hardly any. I know, I know for sure we have over three. I didn't look at anything, any, any, any documents or data today, but I know we have over three, but I, I believe we have maybe even a little over four months of savings in the bank, of operational uh, budget in the bank. I want to get to six, and I eventually want to get to 12. Um, in the last five months, we've completely restructured the org chart of our staff. Everyone has, um, everyone has an oversight. Everyone, before we ever ask what you did and how you're producing and who you brought, we want to know as a pastor, how are you? Amen. I've heard too many stories of amazing people, amazing leaders, amazing ministers that the last two years, they have given everything when the world shut down. And ministry, I mean, I'll never forget because you know, I play golf across the street. Well, not very much at all, really. Uh, I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, when the pandemic hit, I saw business guys that hadn't golfed in months. They had tea time for the next seven days. They were play, you know, I, I said, I said, where, where do you all find the time? They're like, we're off. Oh, we're, we're playing golf. What are you doing? I said, I'm working harder than ever. <laughs> my, 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 my living room turned into a church and for, you know, for, for two months. You know, you know, did, did our best and loved people and, and continue to do that. But we've re completely restructured our ore chart, so we ask more about the health of our staff before we ever ask how they're produced. I can tell you, um, um, we're currently adding to the board of directors. Um, I'm just being transparent, um, without going into all the stuff. I've, I've currently asked two, um, two individuals to prayerfully consider coming on the board. We need, we need some additional board members, and I want more accountability because at the end of the day, all I want to do is simply love my family and preach the gospel. I don't want to have to work and or work or worry about anything as far as the big idea things going again. I'm good with money. I'm not, not a bad business guy, but at the end of the day, I want to make sure that things are structurally sound and sane and safe because I don't want the temptation potentially of when we see three, four, five thousand more campuses and all of a sudden our budget goes from three to twelve million. I don't want to even have even the idea even presented in my mind that I can even look at. I want people that are just helping, assisting. Hey, hey pastor, what do you think? Well, let's pray about it. You know, guys, you vote on it. Okay, let's, let's go. I, 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 just, I just want to love my family and preach the gospel. We now have I'm also greater expectations on our staff. Uh, and yet it's, take, it's taking me a little bit of time to get to this place. These that staff maybe used to get away with, they're not going to get away with. And I love them, uh, I'm, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm a grace guy. But I need to be more of a truth guy. And so I'm not going to let people uh, work out their stuff for 12 months. You can get your crap together in three months, or you need to find another place to go. I appreciate the six, but that, that meant a lot to me. Uh, no, no. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything in particular. I'm just, this is, I'm, I'm giving you stuff over the last 25 years. So I don't have an era. I don't have a year. I don't have a time. You know, but these are things that I've just, again, a little bit of a late bloomer on, but I want more health in my life. Amen. And to make everything in our life go, including your life, to build your dreams, you need money. Yes, 
And I want to give you a biblical word for this because I, just, I, I, re- I really don't like the word money because money's been hijacked by the enemy. It's been used wrongly, uh, especially by church and by people. Uh, I like the word resources. And I want you to hear me. God would love to resource your dreams. And I don't know if you understand that to the, to, to, um, from the standpoint and to the degree that God really means it. God so desires to resource the dreams of your heart that many of you have given up on. And maybe this is the year you dream again. Maybe that's, that's one of the giants that you're going to tear down. Uh, you're going to tear down dead giants and resurrect you know, living, living stones. I don't know. I, I, I don't think you maybe understand how rich your Heavenly Father is. <laughs> I, 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 I really don't think the church does. I mean, he's paved his streets with gold. He builds the foundations of his house with precious stones. They're, they're, they're just laying around. They're laying around in heaven. Wait for someone else to come. Oh, build that. Uh, they'll throw some gems and topaz and whatever. And make, yeah, yeah, princess cut that, that, that door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, 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 just pass away. They're going to be here. Oh, there they are. Yeah, because it's bad of an eye. Oh, there we go. And we're down here struggling financially. Churches are struggling financially. Believers with good hearts are struggling financially. Single parents with great hearts are struggling financially. I, I want you to know Jesus is loaded. And no, before your mind goes there, if you're trying to do church for the year, we are not a money church. We are a gospel center. But money has been hijacked by the enemy. And if you could just find some, here's his heart. If he could just find someone he could trust, he could download on you like you've never been downloaded on before. In fact, 2 Chronicles 22:14. 14, read this quick passage. I've worked hard to provide materials for building the temple of the Lord, nearly 4,000 tons of gold, 40,000 tons of silver, and so much iron and bronze that it cannot be weighed. Okay. I've also gathered timber and stone for the walls, though you, though, though you may need to add more. Uh, gold is measured by the ounce. Uh, right, now, right now, I looked it up this morning. It's a little over $1,800 an ounce. You, you know, so, some of you have gold. Some of you don't. Um, some of you have it in your teeth. It looks great, by the way. There are 16 ounces in a pound. Then there are 2,000 pounds in a ton. So a ton is $57.6 million. I'll just do the math for you to save you time in your calculator app. He gave 4,000 tons of gold to the building fund to transform. And here's what he said. Uh, that's above my tithe. I mean, just to put some of the law-based look, lookers out there, because you know, one of the two biggest problems in the church, people want to argue, Ty, listen, you don't even want to get on the grace aspect of giving. Because law says just tithe. Grace always says, I'm going to go above and beyond. Amen. See, law says don't commit adultery. Grace says don't even look at her. Yeah. Anyway, that went over well, so let's keep going. So I said, here, I'll do the math. That's $230,400,000,000. And then on top of that, you have 40,000 tons of silver. Silver silver is about $282 per pound. That's just under $12 million. Can we just call it what it is? He was rich. He was loaded. And then there's another scripture about him where God says, he was a man after my own heart. Why would God allow him to steward so much money? Because he knew he could trust him. And I'm telling you, money is taking people out left and right. And by the way, the test is not if you can steward much. The test is if you can steward a little. Luke chapter 16 says this. If you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Let me tell you what the true riches of heaven are. And I will tell you, if you've been a part of maybe an organization like this, um, like, like speaking of churches, where people were more or less just enslaved to do things and they were treated as cattle and not resources, I'm really, really sorry. I'm, 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 I'm sorry if you sat under um, you know, the, the eye and, and the authority of an individual who didn't have a good biblical gra- grasp of what people really are because the true riches of heaven are people. You can pray for souls and clients all you want and for your church and for your business to grow. And if you don't handle money right, God will never give you people. Because if you can't handle money, you can't handle people. And please hear me. We do not give to get. That is nowhere in the Bible. We get to give. We don't give to get. And I'll make another statement. 
God does not bless giving. See, see when I make those great statements, that takes a little hair out of the room, doesn't it? You just feel, oh my gosh, I, I knew he was a heretic. I knew it. I was waiting for it. I've been watching the last five years. There it is. There it is. Put it on, put it on Instagram. Put it on the gram. God does not bless giving, semicolon. He blesses giving with the right heart. So if you're giving to get, you're not getting anything from him. The blessed life is not that you get when you give. The blessed life is a life of a giver, not of a getter. I'm always leery of this thing. I've grown around my fair share of amount of these preachers. That you know, um, uh, that uh, that love to give you an amount on the television, or they they get. I don't. I don't, I don't think they've come on the since I've been pastor. I, I I'll shut that down so quick. You ain't, you know. Or maybe in God's grace and the mercy, in the time, I won't beat you in front of somebody, uh, but you won't come back to the pulpit. That give you an amount that you're supposed to give, and they use scriptures. And it's amazing, you know, it's, it's always with the bigger numbers. You know, it's never Roman. It's never Romans twelve three. Hey, for the next twelve months, give three dollars. You know, it, 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 it'd be like, you know, like, you know, Psalm, Psalm 12, 110. Next, for the next 12 months, I want you to give $110 to this ministry. Amazing how that works. Wow. <laughs> Tremendous insight. And then they'll tie in some special number. And this is why the Lord gave it to me. No, you're merchandising the anointing and you need to repent. God does not tell me what you're supposed to give. God only tells you what you're supposed to give. And that's what I'll just tell you. I'm not going to get into all of it. Um, when we used a, um, a company um, to, um, to, um, to help us raise some funds for our transform, the money that came in was nowhere near what we expected. I'll just be honest with you. And the leader, the CEO of the organization said, well, listen, madam, there's more money out there. You know, you know, they, you know, they, you know sometimes people get, you know, you'll get a little iffy, a little sketchy. You know, you know, go back, you know, you know, talk to them, have some meetings. I said, I ain't doing that. Well, I said, if that's what you sell, I said, I ain't buying. I said, if people didn't hear God the first time, then they can hear God on their own the second time without me in their ear. And so, you know, the money came in, that's supposed to come in. And so we trust Jesus. You know, we love to use this phrase, God will never tempt you above that which you're able. Let me say it another way. He will never give you resources above that which you're able to steward. Yeah. That's something you need to focus on. Number two, and the, other, um, the other stone I'm seeing a great deal um, is fame. Fame. I mean, you're like, for Sonny, man, ain't nobody famous. Let me just tell you. Uh, 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 we've, got, we've got famous teenagers. Um, 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 we, 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 have, we have famous pranksters. Uh, we, we, got, we got famous street dancers. I mean... I, I can't keep up with all the platforms. You know, TikTok, they got 9 million followers, and I don't know why they've only got 200,000 on Instagram. I, I don't know. People are making money hand over fist by doing the dumbest things. I will, and I, I'm not trying to poke him at all. You know, again, I've done the same thing just in a different way. way. We, listen, as adults, as parents... Please be careful with how you talk to your kids. I've, I've had to go back to my son. I, in the last six months, I've had to apologize to him more times than I can count because I did not father him really, really well. You know, I, I, I came down on him hard when I'm like, I'm just doing the different, same thing. I just I don't approve of what he's doing with his time. You know, but um, one thing that's become so popular um, with this generation is, they, is they, they love to watch videos of people playing games. I mean, I mean, I mean I, and it's still a waste of time, but you know, stuff I've done. I, mean, you know, I love watching videos of, you know, um, of car chases. You know, you know um, we, um, we, we, we all love the emo emotional videos, you know, you know where, um, where, a, you know, where um, a serviceman will come home and they play that song in the back and everyone's just crying. <laughs> yeah, I've seen his dad in four years. You know, we all love those. But you're watching someone play a game. And then the, 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 you know, and the responses that people just laugh at. I remember looking at my son about oh, four or five weeks ago and I said, you realize you're paying him? He said, what? I said, sure you are. I said, son, uh, I'm, 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 before, before you just hear this as a correction, daddy's doing the same thing. Well, how, how am I paying him? Because time's money. And he is getting you engaged with your emotion, which is causing you to loan your time, which is generating monetized efforts from you into his pocketbook. So, I'm, I'm, so, of course, he's going to keep right-clicking and having the screams and having the funny responses because that sells. 
I mean, you, you, you have famous gamers. You have famous trick shot artists. I mean, look at, um, look at Dude Perfect down in Texas. These guys just, I mean, it's amazing what these guys come up with. And people just watch them left and right. Millions, tens, hundreds of millions of views. And you have famous preachers now too. First Chronicles 14, 17 says this. Then the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. Second Samuel 7, 9. I've been with you wherever you have gone, and I've destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I'll make your name as famous as anyone who's ever lived on the earth. Let me give you the biblical word for fame. It's called influence. And God would like to, would like to not only trust you with resources, he would also like to trust you with influence. So I have a question for you. Maybe you can just keep asking yourself this over the next 21 days or the course of the year. Could God make you famous and you use it to make him famous? All ages, all backgrounds, all ethnicity, ask the question. Could God make you famous and you turn around and make him famous? Could God give you influence? Because all fame is recognition. That's, that's all fame is. Fame is just recognition. Dentists get recognized. People that carry your groceries get recognized. Street performers get recognized. That's all fame is. But do you have influence? Number three, and this is a big one, is sex. Most people know the story of 2 Samuel 11, when, 2 Samuel 11 where David went out on the balcony and he, he saw Bathsheba bathing. And David fell in that area. And there are a lot of people falling in this area. And for the people that are falling publicly, the people that are falling regularly, privately, are at an astounding rate. You know, they say 60% of pastors are hooked on pornography. 40% of women are now hooked on pornography. And I, and I just want to tell you some, I'm just tell you some things. I hope you hear my heart. I really do hope you hear my heart. Sexual pleasure is a gift from God for married couples. God designed your sexual parts. He designed them to have a response. He designed for them to um, um, be felt and, 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 you know, and catered to and, 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 um, and cradled a certain way and loved on. God designed sex to be pleasurable. You know, a guy once told my pastor, uh, my wife doesn't like sex. His response was, well, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's okay to laugh. So, I, it, it's amazing. Just, just, you just mentioned the word sex. People just tense up. But we watched it on every episode that we have outside of the, sh- outside of the church. And I'll tell you why. Because most men pleasure themselves and then go to sleep. And it's wrong. I love you. Been there. It's wrong. And you have no clue. Men have no clue how much intimacy. That's one thing I'm asking God to help us redeem in 23. God, give us the men. Give us all the struggle. You know, I know how people think they look at someone who's, you know, maybe a broke, you know, broken into a bank or, you know, looks at pornography or whatever, you know, you know the big ones, you know, especially in, I know, in, in the marriage circles or I know pornography, you know, and sexual addiction. But that, that's, just, um, that's just the fruit of a, a root. Yes, sir. Men and women that watch pornography, they're numbing the pain because there's a gaping hole in their soul that was caused and created by someone that violated their conscience, their heart, or their trust. You have no clue how much intimacy you'll feel when you focus on giving them, receiving. It breaks my heart to hear couples that argue about sex. And I'll just take give it from my standpoint of what I hear. A lot of times you'll, you know, you know, the woman may have, have a view where you're just doing it to do this. And, then, and the man is really just trying to, listen, I'm just wanting to serve you. I'm not even interested in my needs. And, and there's just such a poor outlook because of maybe what she is told or how he was taught or what he wasn't taught. I remember the struggles that I, I brought into my marriage. You know, and he wanted to get, um, I mean, it's not like they, um, they, there was no addictions. You know, but, um, you know, I, I've seen porn, you know, here and there going into marriage. And, of course, you know, back then you had to work, really work for it on the modem. <laughs> now you ain't going to work for nothing. Like, I want to see porn. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, hey, there you are. Oh, you look nice. Wow, her history. Man, you, you had to, and I'm not trying to be silly. I'm running, I'm, I'm, you know, but I'm just... Forgive me for tying some biblical jokes in and, and, and some puns and some levity because I am a preacher. <laughs> you had to have the patience of Job to look at porn back in the 90s. And it, t- it took an hour for just 10 seconds. You're like, oh, you know what? In fact, that was half the time I gave up. I'm like, I ain't going to sin today. It takes too long. I'll, just go, I'll go live right. You can tell by the silence of people. See, 
that's, that's where the church is at. And we've got to become more comfortable with something that is destroying lives and destroying families. 40% of divorces are now contributed to Facebook. Because people are going out and looking for and chasing things that only God can fill. And today, if you're battling pornography, if you're struggling with pornography, and I just want you to hear me, you know, stealing, lying, coveting, porn, whatever, masturbation, and I know that's, that's a debatable subject. I'm not here to talk about that in certain aspects. If you're battling today, I'm so sorry you're battling. Most of you have battled alone. And that's why incredible things like Celebrate Recovery are, are awesome. Because it isn't about you getting through something. It's about you finding freedom in spite of something. And you're able to live above what you have been living in. And that's the goal of Celebrate Recovery. I, th- I, thought, I thought that marriage would fix everything. And actually, it made it worse. And, and, I want, and I'm just going to tell you, the Bible is silent on what a man and woman who are, who are married can do in a bedroom. And I'm just going to look at the screen, and I'm going to beg all the, I guess I'll just say it. I don't want to use the word prude, even though I just did. Sometimes a little older. The biblical people that are out there trying to tell people what they can and can't do, to please shut your mouth. I would love it if you would just shut up, take care of your own marriage, and let everyone else read the Bible that you're preaching wrongfully out of. There's only one verse in the Bible that defines what a man and a wife um, can do in a bedroom. It's Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. See, that's what everyone law wants to go right there. See, fornicator, you've been fornic- You're missing the whole, the whole idea. In other words, you can have fun in the bedroom. Listen, I don't care if you put a swing in your bedroom. <laughs> have fun. I don't care if you invite us over to your house. Well, just give me a little bit of heads up. And I find a trampoline. I ain't here to ask questions, bro. Good job. <laughs> All right, man. You, know, you want to crease your vert? And that's just a, you know, that's just a subtitle for what? I don't know. I, okay. You know, we, got, we got trampolines. We got merry-go-rounds. Oh, have fun. <laughs> so, see, no, 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 uh, no, one, uh, no one ever um, um, talked about this. I remember being a young, I'll, just, I'll say it this way, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to apologize, I don't, I don't feel bad for saying it. I remember being, being in my 20s, and, you know, I, I'm, and, I, I, and I preached the midweek service with my, 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 my dad pastored. You know, and everything I would say or not say would always get back. That's okay. You know, you know because you know, they're, they're letting, letting the pastor, who's my dad, know. And I would always, I would always be asked one thing, to take the offering. Yeah, dad, I took the offering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't worry, we made sure people knew that they were going to give. I uh, didn't want anyone going to hell. And, uh, son, I uh, heard, you talk, heard you talked about sex tonight. Yeah. And you used the word masturbation? Sure did. My God, son. <laughs> I said, well, Dad, people are doing it. That's how you got here. <laughs> well, now, son, listen, there's just certain things. I said, Dad, it's in the Bible. Well, well I said, Dad, we're going to have to just agree to disagree. And that, 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 was, that was our conversation. I never heard about sex growing up. The world loves it, and unfortunately, they just love it in the wrong placement of things. And the church who should be loving it and enjoying it can't because they've got all these different views going through their head. If we'd stop being so hung up with all these things that you can't do with your spouse, you'd have more fun with your spouse. Here's one thing I wrote down last night. Satan isn't going to tell you what you can do in the bedroom. He's going to, he, only God will. Satan wants to convince you of what everything you can do outside of your bedroom and outside of your marriage bed. So listen, if there's something that violates your conscience, let God tell you. Stop thinking because it's different or the way your grandparents did it in their flannels. It's unholy and not of God. And I guess I'll just say it this way because my pastor said it a few months ago. And just to let everyone know, there is one more, but there is another position outside of missionary. But I just want to throw that out there. Make everyone uncomfortable. We're already there. We've taken something so holy and so special, and we've doused it in religion and law. I need to remind you of what 2 Corinthians 3 says. Law brings forth death. And by the way, your conscience came into existence when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Your conscience tells you what's good and bad. God never wanted you to live on what you think is good and bad. Please hear me. He wanted you to live on the voice of God. 
for the most part, if more couples, thank you, I appreciate those amens from even the kids. I'll take every amen I can get right now. For the most part, if more couples would have fun at home, they wouldn't be tempted to go somewhere else to have fun. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. Please hear me. And this is what I want to get to. Because I think sometimes if you've been hurt, all you're going to hear is that, oh, I'm just, I'm just encouraging all this stuff and you're wanting me to be a robot. No. Your hurt heart isn't hearing the passionate plea that I'm making biblically. Yes, sir. If you have, please hear me, if you've ever experienced abuse, and most of it, mainly it's, it's women. Guys here and there, I know what's happened, but mainly it's women. On any level, physically, emotionally, and especially sexually, I am beyond sorry that no one looked out for you and someone violated you. And on behalf of the person that didn't ask, I'm going to do representational repentance. I'm sorry, and I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive them. But I'm going to beg you to please get some counseling. Please get some therapy. Because as you get older, and some of you know, I'm, your sex drive diminishes. I'm just going to talk to you. I'm just going to talk to you even as, as a brother. I'm going to encourage you to please go to a, find a doctor. Get HRT. Get some hormone replacement therapy if you need to. For both men and women, hormones are so powerful. They're incredible when used well and when you get with the right doctor. And because it does happen, um, you know, with just hormones and testosterone and all that stuff, things diminishing, all of a sudden you read about a guy, and I, I read about a lot of ministers in the last two years, a guy in his 60s committing adultery with a woman in their 40s. I'm not approving of that behavior. But I've, we've, I've heard from more and more men. Matt, it's been the biggest struggle of my life the last 10 years. I'm 55, and things were so incredible for so many years in the last 10 years. It's just nothing. And my wife doesn't have a desire anymore, and I'm not blaming women. Please hear me. I'm not using this as a, as, as a pulpit to bully or to encourage or to get on guy's side. A woman said, I'm trying to encourage you, and you're going to see what I mean in here in a minute. But these men will say, I've struggled. And that's not an excuse, but much of what they're going through, spouses, and what most of what your spouses are going through, men and women can be helped. Now, ladies, listen, I talked to men for a moment. I want to talk to you. Don't you pleasure yourself and go to sleep. <clears throat> ladies, I would just encourage you to understand this is a need that God gave men. I'm not making this as a plea for men. I'm just letting you know from all the counseling that we do, I've talked to Pastor Kirk. I've talked to other people in other churches. And I don't think it's any surprise that men list sex as their number one. It's a close one. If not, if it's two, it's a close, it's nearly one. It's like a one, one. It's like a 1.2. Like we're not even going to get the two. Honor sex. Respect sex. It's sex. I mean, you're like, I know, he asks for it every day. And, and we make a lot of that, but I encourage you to explore and ask the Holy Spirit for some help and insight. Yes, sir. And I know men want it a lot. And to put in perspective, sex on a woman's list is number 13. <laughs> well, 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 I'll have you teach a class. <laughs> and to put it even in additional perspective, uh, you know, on, on average, you know, sex is number 13 on a women's list, and number 12 is gardening, just to kind of let you know where it falls. <laughs> so, yes, men don't, you know, women don't, don't desire it to the level of men, but there are things we both can do, and men also need to learn how to cater and to love and to encourage, and that I tell you one thing, if I've learned anything in the last five years, I don't, I don't do laundry, I don't sweep the floor. I don't run errands. I don't help with my wife, who's a working woman. I don't do it for sex. I do it because I'm called to love. Amen. And when you get to a point in place where you're not doing it out of expectation or obligation, and that's the problem with most men and women. Men like, well, I've, I've got, no, no. You get to help with the kids. You get to take out the trash. You get to take her car when it's cold and put gas in it. And ladies, you get to here and there, as you all discuss it, to pleasure and, you know, and, and be involved from a sexual standpoint and to affirm him and all those amazing, wonderful things. When you can get over the word duty, and I hate that word because a lot of people treat things that are beautiful as dutiful, and that's why you're missing out on the pleasure of what God called you to have and enjoy. 
Number four, we're going to get through it. Gosh, what a, what a day to start children's ministry, and I'm going way over. Um, number four, got to get through this quick, seriously. Um, energy. Energy is a major one. 2 Samuel 21, 15, and I'll just go to the end. David became weak and exhausted, and that's when the giant thought he could kill David. Goliath or Goliath's brothers or sons think they can kill you and attack you when you're weak and exhausted. I would encourage you to buy, and buy my pastor's book. Um, Robert Morris, take a day off. I'd encourage every single one of you, especially if you're in corporate America, to find and read. It would be the best investment you make. Take a day off. I don't understand how in the world the church preaches and espouses and declares and has these big high and mighty services on having no gods before me, no adultery, never lie. Don't you dare cheat. You know how we all do. We got to, like, 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 like that's a divine you know, exclamation point. I'm, 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 I'm like, do you do the voiceovers for AMC 30? You know, <laughs> press one. Okay. I may need to try to do some more. I think I, I make some money like that. I don't know. Honor your father and your mother. Listen here. We'll say that to our kids. Don't you commit adultery. Don't, don't murder. But you work seven days a week. Which is the same as everything else that you don't do. It says you shall cease from your labor. Do not work. That means you don't answer emails. You don't post on social media or whatever work is when you're at home. I know there are exceptions, but on the average, on the daily, on the reg. You know, I can't, I, I don't understand. The Sabbath is a gift from God, and, the, and people, especially the church, don't take it. I can't understand why, why God said it's a gift, and we treat it like, like, like it's a shackle, it's a chain. And I'll tell you why you don't take breaks. If you own a business or you're part of a business or you're trying to work up the corporate ladder, let me tell you why you don't take breaks. You're like, oh, I don't, no, I, I, no, no, I, I want to tell you why you don't take breaks. Because you don't think the business can survive without you because you know more than God. That's, I'm, that's why, I'm why we don't tithe. We think we need the 100. But God does more in your 90 than he does the 100, and so it's the, same, it's the same principle. We think that God can't handle this without us, so he needs our extra day. And so our energy gets slow. And that's when the enemy attacks. Number five, people. Now, I'm going to go through these really, really quick. There's four categories of people. Three of these I got from Henry Cloud. I'm going to cover the four groups. There's wise, foolish, evil, and then there's good people. The first one, again, I got from Henry Cloud. It's in a book called Necessary Endings. Phenomenal book. And you need to decide what kind of person you're dealing with. And do we have Proverbs 9, 8 on the screen? Can you, did I send that to you guys? Probably. Ah, yes. So, so don't bother correcting me. Mockers, they will only hate you. But correct the wise, they will love you. Let me give you a little overview. Wise people will thank you when you correct them. You're like, you know, I want wise kids. Well, um, again, give them, give them a little bit of mercy. They're 13. But do they thank you when, you know, do the people around you, do they thank you when you correct them? Wise people will adapt their behavior to truth. In other words, you say, this is what's going on, and you need to change this. Wise people will go out of that meeting. They will love you. They will receive your counsel. They will adapt their behavior for, to the truth. Let me tell you what foolish people do. Foolish people, when you tell them the truth, they will adapt the truth to their behavior. They'll tell you it's not their fault. It's somebody else's fault. I cannot tell you how much I wish I had this stuff, this insight years ago. Because I have spent too much time talking to fools. You, you, you can't talk to a fool. We think because we're good communicators, see, again, it's, it's back on you. And we, 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 we lay awake at night, and, you know, we even pop an extra uh, pill to keep us up so we can get extra energy and, and rob us of sleep because we, don't, you know, we know more than God, and we can do great without rest, which absolutely violates physiological law, okay? And we stay awake at night, and we think of what we can say. It's going to change their mind. Uh -uh, no. You cannot change them with a new way of talking or, explana or explaining You've already had five meetings with them. They're still foolish. Fools do not respond to conversation. They only respond to consequence. So this, this is going to, if you have a business, this will help you today. Stop talking to them and tell them, when I talk to you, I love you. It's not helping. So now we're going to initiate consequences. And sometimes they'll respond and sometimes they won't. And I promise you, when you get a foolish person off of your staff, off of your team and out of your life, your morale will soar. It's amazing how much it'll go up. Foolish people don't mean to hurt people, but they do. Evil people mean to hurt people. I love what Henry Cloud says. He says this. He says it this way. So if you get, if you're mad at me, just you know, send him a send him send Henry Cloud a message. With evil people, use lawyers, guns, and money. 
That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. In other words, you protect yourselves. You talk to the wise, you give consequences to the fool, and you protect yourself from evil people, and then you've got good people. Listen, people are gifts from God. Well, not evil people, but God still uses them. Let me tell you how good people, and this is maybe where I don't want you to get caught up before you leave, how good people can be a Goliath after you. This person is good, but has insecurity in them that's never been healed. So they tell you what, they, what you want to hear. They want to help you. They want to be your best friend. They want to serve you. They want to assist you. They come alongside. They, you, you think, man, this is the best employee. This is the best individual. This is the best friend I've ever had because they see the touch of God in your life and on your business, and they know they don't have the touch of God on their life like you do, and they can't get recognition by just being your friend. And here's how you know the difference. I personally think Jonathan in the Bible, though good, had insecurity. And I've referenced this before when I, when I preached on the Jezebel spirit. David said this about Jonathan in Psalms 55. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you and men my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. Verse 20. He has put forth his hands against those who are at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. See, some people think this was Absalom. Nah, it's not the same timeline as, as Absalom. He was talking about Jonathan because then 1 Samuel 23, 17 says, And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king of Israel, and I shall be next to you. In other words, I'm going to get to be your number two. How do you know if good people can be a Goliath in your life? They constantly need recognition. They chew you out because you didn't recognize them at a leader's event. They give you the silent treatment because they weren't asked or their child wasn't asked to be a part of something that was connected to you. And here's the one thing that's been a key eye-opener for me the past few years. And you won't know it. And I'll just be honest with you. I don't know any other way to tell you other than this. You won't know it until the good people are no longer in your life. They'll rarely to never reach out and check on you as they once did now that your friendship or their paycheck is no longer needed. Everything was great. The pastures were green. They loved you. They had sent responses to you. And the second, they no longer need you. Your affirmation isn't good enough. Your paycheck isn't good enough. They found something else better. They'll leave you and you'll never hear from them again. And you have to forgive and love and, and be available because they might come back one day and, and who knows. And you want them to come back into an open, healed heart, not into a wounded, bitter heart. So, there are those, those are, so those are five smooth stones given by God. Resources, influence, sexual intimacy, energy, and friends. These are all good from God, but you've got to watch out if Goliath gets a hold of one of them because it can destroy your life. And it has destroyed thousands, tens of thousands by the day, by the hour, the last few years, over the course of human history. And he's not done, and he wants to take you out. But with faith, trusting Jesus, leaning into Jesus, community, prayer and fasting, you can overcome. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we trust you today. And Father, right now, we just we say even out loud, as we always do, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want us to learn? What is our takeaway from this message? Show us. Give us insight. It may be five. It may be none. I don't know what it might be, but I thank you right now for revealing truth to us. And that truth will make and set us free and keep us free in Jesus' name. If you're here this morning, you're not where you should be with Jesus. Forget about the five stones. The biggest stone, the biggest barrier is that you're not right with Jesus. Maybe at one time you were, but you've broken fellowship. Maybe some stones have come into your life and they've broken fellowship. Or maybe you've never walked with Christ. Maybe you've never perceived him as your Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning and you're like, Matt, I'm not where I should be with Jesus, but my goodness, on the first day of a brand new year, I would love to, I would love to start this year out with a, new, with a Savior, with a friend, with a counselor, with a help, and with my sins forgiven. If that's you, I want to pray for you right where you're at. And if that's you, would you mind just slip up your hand long enough for me to recognize it? Say, Matt, God bless you, sir. Who else? Who else? Matt, pray for me. I'm not where I should be with Jesus. I want to make sure I'm right with Christ. Proud of you. Who else? Thank you, my friend. Wow. In the back. Thank you. In the, in, in the seats. Absolutely. In the bleachers. Yep. In the very, very back. Thank you. Who else? Thank you, buddy. Thank you, sir. Who else? Thank you, buddy. Amen. We're going to slay giants this year, church. You won't recognize you. You won't recognize your family. You won't recognize your commitment. You won't recognize this church January 1st of 24. Because we are going with health and strength and the Spirit of God in us, back in us. We're going to move 
things like never before. We're going to declare, we're going to speak, and we're going to receive all that heaven has for us. Because there's a lot of people that are good givers, are good receivers, but very few people are good givers and receivers. And God, my prayer is prophetically, teach us how to be both. In Jesus' name, would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I invite your son Jesus into my life. And I confess to you all my sin. Your word promises me that what I confess, you completely forgive. So as of right now, I don't have a past. I have a bright future. Fill me with your spirit and give me wisdom for the days ahead. In Jesus' name. Fast to prayer tomorrow. If you fall off, fall down, get back up. Somebody in your life needs the love of Jesus. Somebody in your business, in your cubicle, needs the love of Jesus. And you might be the only Jesus someone sees and hears. I beg you, shine. Love you.